I'm Chris Hansen, right now on Crime Watch Daily from here in New York. A single mother working at a gas station vanishes without a trace. She was struck potentially over the head and then dragged into this van and then taken away. Now, why Jessica Herringa's disappearance could blow the lid off something truly terrifying. This was a vehicle designed to not only kidnap, but take sexually advantage of women. The tiny clue that led to this man's capture. Did cops stop a serial killer before he struck again? Plus, a coal miner's wife keeping a dirty secret. He suspected that she was having an affair. Sleeping with the exterminator. A love triangle that's about to turn deadly. Esther said, well, you finally got what you wanted. Right now. Andrea Isom, sir, with Crime Watch yeah. Daily. Jason Matera with Crime Watch Daily. This. I'm Elizabeth. I'm here with Crime Watch. I'm Michelle from Crime Watch Daily. Anna Garcia from Crime Watch. Is Crime Watch oh, Daily. Stay off my property. We'll find you again. We always do. Hey everyone, welcome to Crime Watch Daily. I'm Chris Hansen. First up today, new details on a murder mystery out of Michigan. A single mother working at a gas station vanishes without a trace. And now it appears her disappearance may have been just a part of a much larger, sick, and twisted plan. Once a person of interest, now public enemy number one. This individual, Mr. Willis, is a monster. This man, Jeffrey Willis, charged in the kidnapping and murder of Jessica Herringa. We recovered handcuffs and a rope. The deeper cops dig, the sicker things get. This was a vehicle designed to not only kidnap, but take sexual advantage of women. Do investigators have a serial killer on their hands? Attacker, sexually assault her. Uh, there's other videos found where at the end of them, murder. And if he's the guy cops think he is, did he act alone? Jessica was working alone at this gas station in Norton Shores, a bedroom community on Lake Michigan. Jessica's mother, Shelly, tells our Grand Rapids affiliate WXMI she always worried about her daughter's safety. I was so worried. I mean, that was like our conversation every time I would go up there. Police say it appeared to be a routine night until a guy in a silver minivan parks behind the building. That's the van in this surveillance video from the cameras at the pump. The gas station manager and her husband just happened to be driving by and told cops something just didn't seem right. What they saw was a male figure at the rear of the van with the back hatch open. It appeared to them that he was moving something inside the van, like adjusting something. Sometime after 11, a customer walked in, didn't see anyone, and called 911. I just got a work on the Exxon gas station on Sternberg Road, kind of Sternberg and Old Van Haven. Okay. And there's nobody here. When cops arrived, Jessica was gone. In the back room, investigators found her jacket and her purse, containing over $400. The cash register was untouched. The trash can was by the door. This wasn't a robbery, but outside they do find one clue. And it's a little stain, a little drop of blood. And they test it, and it turns out that it's Jessica's blood. And that could have meant that she was ambushed when she was going outside, perhaps to open up the door to take out the garbage. And she was struck, potentially over the head, and then dragged into this van and then taken away. Crime Watch Daily's Billy Jensen explains why tracking down that van was so difficult. She was looking at a car that was a silver Chrysler Town & Country minivan. There's 15,000 of those minivans in Michigan alone. That's not even counting the, the surrounding states. Police mounted a massive search using helicopters and canines, but the trail went cold. The lead detective still believing Jessica was alive and being held against her will. Nobody's found a, a body or remains or clothing or anything else have evidence to suggest that uh, um, Jessica is deceased. I have to go on the assumption and belief that she is still alive somewhere. While there were security cameras outside, there were none inside, which might have captured the abduction. If you have a daughter, a sister, um, thank God that they're still with you. Detectives reportedly had at least a half dozen possible persons of interest. 
One was this guy, Brad Mason, suspected of kidnapping and sexually assaulting two women resembling Jessica. Almost a year after Jessica vanished, Kalamazoo cops shot and killed Mason as they tried to arrest him in connection with those kidnappings. A lot of people think that Brad Mason, who has a history of sexual assault, was on the sex offender registry. A lot of people think that he could have been the reason for Jessica's disappearance. The lead detective in the case believes Jessica could still be alive, but if Brad Mason is dead, where's Jessica? Then, three years after Jessica went missing, a dramatic and disturbing new development. An attempted kidnapping of a 16-year-old girl turns multiple investigations upside down. He reached for the gun and pointed it at me, and I jumped out. Coming up, a toolbox used for torture? The discovery of the restraints and the syringes sent up a significant red flag. Now, cops wonder if the man who took Jessica is a sadistic serial killer as they track a trail of crimes. Young mother Jessica Herringa was at work when police say evil walked into her gas station. Jessica would never be seen again, and the mystery of what may have happened to her might have never come to light if police say the alleged suspect didn't try to strike again. 25-year-old single mother Jessica Herringa was gone, kidnapped while working the night shift alone at a Michigan gas station. From the start, we, we had the belief that um, the person who abducted Jessica knew her, and she knew her abductor. But after three years and hundreds of tips, there were no arrests. It's just scary. This guy's still out there. Maybe he's done this again. We don't know. You know, we have no idea why he chose Jess. Then a dramatic break. In the same area, an attempted kidnapping and sexual assault of a 16-year-old girl. The teen was lost walking on a rural road when she says a man offered her a ride. Once in the car, he pulled a gun on her. The teenager managed to jump out of the moving van and run away. She later picked her alleged abductor out of a lineup. Tuesday morning, police arrested 47-year-old Jeffrey Willis. He's a very, very dangerous man and was very much a threat to this community. And that threat has now been nullified. Cops searched Jeffrey Willis's house and his silver minivan. A van matching the description of the one seen at the gas station the night Jessica went missing. What they find will soon change everything. The discovery of the, the restraints and, and the, the syringes to us sent up a significant red flag. Detectives say Willis's van is a vehicle almost customized for a predator, equipped with toolboxes of terror. Uh, investigators recovered uh, multiple syringes of a liquid that appears to be a drug or uh, a sedative of some kind in a hidden compartment. We recovered handcuffs and a rope. This was a vehicle designed to not only kidnap but also take sexual advantage of women. And cops find even more disturbing items. Wrist restraints, a ball gag, and on his home computer images of child porn women in bondage along with kidnap and kill videos. Attacker, sexually assault her. Uh, and there's other videos found where at the end of them, um, they murder in a acting way. And we also found videos that show this um, that are not acted. Real life. They're real life. In the case of the 16-year-old, Jeffrey Willis was charged with kidnapping and assault with a dangerous weapon. The developments of that case have started us in a direction to potentially close two other very serious cases. Those two other cases? Jessica, who was never found in the cold-blooded murder of another woman, Rebecca Bletch. The hardest thing is just miss my sister. I just miss her. I would give anything to call her. One year after Jessica Herringa disappeared, 36-year-old Rebecca was murdered, shot in the head while she was jogging on this road. Her murder also unsolved. I believe it was just random. I think the whole time I've said this was a random act. Anybody who knew Becky, nobody would have done this to her. But during the search of Willis's van, detectives say they found a 22 caliber handgun. And ballistics matched the bullets recovered from Rebecca's body and shell casings found at the scene. At his home, they also found files on a hard drive labeled VIX, short for victims and two subfolders with the initials RSB and JLH for Rebecca Sue Bletch 
and Jessica Lynn Herringa. In those folders, photos of both victims along with news reports about their cases. They even found a password to several websites, J4L27H13, Jessica's initials, and the date of the day after her disappearance. Willis, wearing shackles in court, was charged with Rebecca's murder and possession of child pornography. You didn't count one murder, Rebecca Bletch. Crime Watch Daily has learned new details about Willis's past. He used to work as a janitor at this elementary school. You heard right, he was around children. Principal Amy Upham says Willis spent a little too much time in the school computer lab. We had a uh, suspicious URL pop up on our computer. It was of a pornographic nature. The principal says Willis was fired immediately. He turned over his keys and he walked out. He obviously had no regard for his actions. Crime Watch Daily obtaining a termination letter, claiming in part his inappropriate use of a school computer caused a student to be exposed to a website that should have been for adults only. Despite evidence found in his car and home, strangely, prosecutors didn't charge him with Jessica's disappearance. But then another break. A second arrest. It was Willis's cousin, Kevin Bloom, a prison guard with the Michigan Department of Corrections. First charged with lying to police about the Rebecca Bledge case, and then again for lying about Jessica's case. Kevin Bloom's father says he was lying to protect his cousin. They were friends. They hung around with each other. And I just wish he'd, you know, tell them the truth. You know, he didn't do anything. <laughs> just try, try to protect Jeff. Weeks later, Kevin Bloom flips the script. Jeffrey Willis did do it. That's what his cousin is telling police dis investigating the disappearance of Jessica Herringa. Court documents reveal Bloom told police days after Jessica went missing, he had seen a blonde woman tied up in the basement of a home previously owned by Willis's grandfather. He said the woman wasn't moving, and he believed her to be Jessica Herringa. He also told police he was forced to help Jeffrey Willis take care of Jessica. He later recanted these stories. Kevin Bloom eventually pleaded guilty to lying to police. He was sentenced to time served until a new charge kept him from walking a free man. Police say the evidence and interviews led to two men, Jeffrey Willis and his cousin, prison guard Kevin Bloom. Both are now charged in the kidnapping and killing of the young mother. Reportedly, it was Bloom's accounts plus credit card and phone records that led to Jeffrey Willis being charged with Jessica's murder. His cousin, Kevin Bloom, was charged with accessory after the fact. In my opinion, we found Jessica's killer. A couple of months later, at an evidentiary hearing, a shocker. Jeffrey Willis takes the stand, claiming guards violated attorney-client privilege after they searched his cell and allegedly read the notes meant for his attorney. Your claim is, is that you told those deputies verbatim, these are notes from my lawyer. I said those are my attorney notes, yes. The 14 pages of notes that were the subject of the September 2nd search anywhere on there that says notes for Brian, uh, attorney notes, confidential, privilege, any of those words appear in any one of those pages? Um, no, but I'm sure that they were. I mean, you can see that they were. Okay. So that's all I need to know, sir. Four days after that, at a hearing to determine if there was enough evidence to have Willis stand trial for Jessica's murder, more than 20 witnesses took the stand, including the 16-year-old who started it all. Photos of her injuries shown to the courtroom. When I asked for his phone, he said his phone was dead. Okay. And that's when I asked him to stop. Okay. And did he stop? He no. He just stared at me. He slowed down, but he didn't stop. And that's when he reached for the gun and pointed it at me, and I jumped out. He went behind his van and aimed the gun at me, and I just yelled at him to please not kill me. Jeffrey Willis's defense attorney argued the other two cases aren't linked to Jessica's case, and... There is no direct evidence tying him to the disappearance of Jessica Herring. After the four-day hearing, based on the evidence found in the minivan, the gun, the videos of victims being raped and killed, the folders found on Jeffrey Willis's hard drive, the connections to the 16-year-old's kidnapping, and the murder of Rebecca Bletch. I find that to be relevant evidence as to uh, the demise of Jessica Lynn Herringa. The judge handed down his decision. Willis should be bound over to circuit court on the charges of open murder. Uh, and on the charge of kidnapping. But as her family awaits justice, there is still no trace of Jessica, and the search for her remains still continues. The investigation will not be complete until we have a conviction and until we bring Jessica home to her family.
Willis's defense team recently filed a motion to dismiss the Bletch murder case. As of right now, the judge has not made a decision on that motion. You can check for the very latest on this story 24-7 on our website. That's CrimeWatchDaily.com. Coming up, the coal miner, the exterminator, and the woman caught in the middle. Crime Watch Daily inside the twisted love triangle turned deadly. I just I wish I could have kept him from going. Now, police want to know, was it self-defense or cold-blooded murder? That's next. Now to a deadly love triangle out of West Virginia. Michael Steins had fallen for Sharon Ward. Problem is, she was married to another man. And soon a confrontation between the two men would leave one of them dead and the other facing charges. But the big question, was it really murder or self-defense? Here's Anna Garcia. It was a twisted, tawdry love triangle. It was pretty nasty. I mean, it was a, a nasty situation. Involving a beloved young coal miner, his much older wife, and the local exterminator. He told Chris that he was the exterminator for a reason. It was just juicy small town gossip until one of the key players is exterminated. I yelled across the across the yard at her and said, you know, asked her, said, well, bitch, you finally got what you wanted. They had a marriage made in the coal mining mountains of Beckley, West Virginia. Chris Ward, a strapping six foot two, 257 pound miner and loving father who worked long hours to provide for his family. He's a big teddy bear. <laughs> Chris was a good guy. He was loved by everybody. I haven't found anybody that really didn't love him except for maybe Sharon. Sharon is Chris's wife, almost 10 years his senior, a stay-at-home mom to their three small children. Chris was crazy about her. She was just as nice as can be, sweet, you know, but she had her, her side to her. According to Chris's family, it's a very dark side. She would manipulate Chris quite a bit. She would talk down to him and just very disrespectful. I was surprised that he just stood there and took it. But Sharon claims it was Chris who was the abusive one, both verbally and physically. Chris didn't have a bad of temper as Sharon would say he did. The endless bickering eventually took its toll and Chris and Sharon separated. They even filed for divorce. We wanted him to move on because we just did not feel like they were going to be able to make it. Instead, it was the beginning of a swinging door relationship you know, he'd always go back. Chris had a love for her, and he loved his children, and he continued to go back to try to make it work. And it did work until Chris became suspicious about this man, Michael Steins, the local exterminator. As they say, the mountains have ears, and you get told a lot of things. Chris found out Steins was making an unusual amount of house calls to Sharon. He suspected that she was having an affair, but she really didn't confirm it. Um, but he just knew and felt it. It was the couple's next door neighbor, Debbie Miles, who finally revealed Sharon's dirty little secret. Chris would come to me and he'd say, Debbie, I know that it's going on. I said, Chris, I'm not gonna lie to you. Yes, it's going on. It was very hurtful to him to know that she was seeing someone else. Sharon and the exterminator soon began to flaunt their relationship around town. Chris even has a tense run-in with the happy couple. There were words exchanged, and he basically, at that point in time, he told Chris that he was the exterminator for a reason, and he could come and see him any time to find out. Chris finally had enough. He moved in with his parents, telling friends it was the exterminator who killed his marriage. He asked me if I would go with him to the house to get some of his personal belongings. Chris's close friend, Bill Dunkley, says he got a bad feeling and made Chris promise not to go alone. I said, under the circumstances, I said, just don't go by yourself. <clears throat> and he said he wouldn't. Chris kept his promise, but Bill missed his call. Well, I was in the middle of something, and I didn't answer his call. Chris decides to go anyway. I just, I wish I would have answered the phone. Maybe I could have kept him from going. Sharon claims once inside the house, Chris becomes violent. But instead of dialing 911, she calls her new boyfriend, Michael. I believe that 
Sharon worked up Michael Steins, telling him Chris did this, Chris did that. Michael grabs his 9 millimeter semi-automatic and drives toward the house, but he doesn't stop. He went and sat at a church. Michael reportedly sits in front of this church right down the street and tries to call Sharon, but she hangs up. With that, he heads toward the house, unholsters his gun, and dashes toward the door. Seconds later... And I believe when he came in that house, he knew what he was going to do. Up next, who shot who? There's only three people that know the truth, and that's Michael Steins, my brother, and God. And the triple X work order that exposes everything. The salacious scandal of the coal miner, the exterminator, and the married mom of three has tongues wagging in the tiny town of Beckley, West Virginia. While Chris Ward was working long hours in the coal mines, his wife Sharon was tending to their three kids at home. And according to neighbors, Sharon apparently had sort of a bed bug problem, calling the exterminator Mike Steins at all hours of the night to help scratch a personal itch. Chris discovered that she was seeing him, and he was living at the house in the evenings, basically staying overnight and then going to work the next day. The exterminator reportedly wrote up fake work orders describing services he wanted to perform on Sharon, saying he wanted to probe the married mother's private parts at least three times a week. He was upset. He worried for his children. He didn't know anything about this person, um, so he was very concerned. When someone ratted out Sharon and her Spider-Man, Broken-hearted Chris reluctantly went home to get his belongings and move out, but emotions boiled over. Sharon claims her husband became violent, so she called the exterminator to come to her rescue. I think Sharon was feeding Mike Steins, you know, stuff like saying I was, I'm being abused. Investigators say Steins raced toward the house, but first stopped at this local church. Then police claim he took out a loaded 9 millimeter gun and drove back to Chris and Sharon's house. Then they say he walked through the door with his finger on the trigger. Seconds later, Chris Ward is shot. Bleeding to death on the bedroom floor. Steins tells cops Chris pushed Sharon and then came after him. The exterminator claims Chris wrestled him for the gun and it accidentally went off. Chris's family says... That's pretty much BS. You've got two guys about my size, 200 plus pounds, fighting in a bedroom. You would think that you're gonna have things knocked off the dresser, things knocked off the chest or drawers. There was nothing disturbed in that room. Chris suffered massive injuries. Evidence shows he was pistol whipped across his face. Basically, my brother was brutally beat um, and shot, and Mr. Steins had a scratch on his back, yay long. Chris's family believe Steins walked through that door with one thing in mind, to get Chris out of the picture. He said he takes the gun in to maybe scare him. You don't take a gun in to scare somebody. You bring it out of the holster, you've got one intention. Hours later, the burly 39-year-old dad of three young children dies from his injuries. I went to the hospital and waited for what seemed to be forever and walked down the forever hall, as I called it, to go into a room to be told that he was gone. Steins tells police he acted in self-defense, but that's where his story gets tricky. Can someone actually claim self-defense if they carry a loaded gun into someone else's home and kill them? He went to the house and he got out with the gun. Chris was in his home. He didn't have a weapon or anything else. There was no threat of violence to him. He didn't have to go there. All rise. It's a precedent-setting case that a grand jury would decide. When he pushed me, he came out of the bedroom and just attacked Mike. Sharon Ward testifies her estranged husband attacked the exterminator. He, like, went over top of me, and they started wrestling or uh, 
struggling, and then they went in the into our bedroom, and they were still struggling. I'm laying like this, and he's kind of like on top, and he's a pretty big guy. How big is he? I didn't know at the time. I thought maybe 300 pounds. He was pretty big. Steins testified he was terrified for his life. I felt like, uh, you know, if he would have been successful to get the gun away from me, I probably would have been shot. Uh, I was scared, uh, and I, I just really wanted to get out there. Mr. Steins was very cocky. I think he really thought he had a self-defense plea. Was it a desperate act by a man trying to protect himself or a cold-blooded murder by a jealous lover? Let's see a black eye on Michael Steins. Let's see at least a split lip. Let's see a broken fingernail. There was no struggle. There was an execution. The grand jury indicts Steins on one charge of murder. He's convicted and sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. But the reaction from Chris's family isn't what most expected. I feel sorry for Mike Steins because he was put in a predicament and he didn't know both sides of the story. They believe Steins isn't the only one who should be behind bars. I think Mike Steins was a pawn. You know, Sharon got what she wanted. Sharon was the sole benefactor to her husband's $92,000 life insurance policy. Still, authorities don't believe she had anything to do with the planning or murder of her husband, and no charges have ever been filed against her. Michael Steins plans to appeal, but for now, the exterminator sits behind bars, and the woman the family calls the Black Widow has a brand new boyfriend. We just want justice all the way. Still to come, a teen ends her shift at work, then vanishes. It became a murder investigation about seven and a half hours later. Who would strangle an innocent girl? The man who has lived under a cloud of suspicion is missing, but his daughter has a message for him. It hurts, huh? A lot. Next. Now to Maryland, where there is a new push to help solve one of the state's most troubling murder mysteries ever. Michelle Sagona is here now with the latest. Chris, Julie Ferguson had just got off her shift from work and was waiting for her friends to pick her up. But instead, she got into another car, one with a killer inside. A teenage schoolgirl is found strangled with her throat slashed. From ear to ear, like a happy face was in it. And baffled cops have been unable to catch the beast who killed Julie Ferguson. There was no explanation, no rhyme or reason behind what took place. But a shadow of suspicion has always hung over this man. We're still considering him as being possibly involved in Julie's murder. The problem is his family says he's vanished. I don't know where he is. Now the most unlikely victim in this murder mystery is begging him to come forward, his own daughter. She's desperately trying to find her father in the hope she can persuade him to come back and clear his name. That hurts, huh? A lot. Julie, 17, was a popular high school senior in Greenbelt, Maryland, on the outskirts of Washington, D.C. Just not a mean bone in her body, really nice and funny. A good friend. Remembering Julie brings tears to the eyes of those who loved her. And mom Pat remains so grief stricken, she finds it difficult to even talk about her daughter. I can't do it. It seems like Julie was here one moment and then suddenly gone the next. It's incredible, it's insane how she just vanished. It just doesn't make any sense. Shelly Griffith and a couple of Julie's other friends were supposed to meet her around 10 p.m. after she got off her after-school job at this Greenbelt strip mall. I was going to get Julie the night she got killed and she wasn't there. But Julie's friends found her belongings where she had been seen waiting for them to arrive just minutes earlier. We're like, what's going on here? That's her stuff. 
and her panicked friends notified her mother and the police. Uh, it became a murder investigation about seven and a half hours later. That's when a passerby found Julie's body in a park about five miles away at 5.30 the next morning. Her throat was cut, but it was later determined that she died from strangulation. Homicide detective Bernard Nelson says there was no sign of robbery or sexual assault, but there were reportedly bruises on Julie's hands that indicated she'd struggled with her killer. She fought for her life. She sure did. Her friends were distraught and terrified there was a maniac on the loose. Are they coming back? Are they going to attack somebody else? Is anybody safe? Is it somebody that we know? Is it a stranger? Is it somebody who's doing this like on a serial basis? The entire community of Greenbelt was on edge. It shook the neighborhood, shook them up quite a bit because they're not used to something like this. Witnesses reported seeing several suspicious vehicles at the strip mall where Julie was last seen alive. One that stuck out in particular was described as a a burgundy or red Volkswagen Jetta that was occupied by two black males and a black female who were seen actually conversing with Julie before she disappeared. That car and the people inside it were never located, but police nonetheless believe Julie was probably taken against her will. Someone could have actually just grabbed her and forced her into a vehicle and left the shopping center. Police questioned a spurned admirer. He was considered a suspect because he made a number of passes at Julie, which he rejected, uh, which he didn't take very well. That suspect would later be convicted of a separate homicide and is now behind bars. Uh, we've talked to him on numerous occasions, even as recent as earlier this, this year. But at this time, we have nothing to actually prove that he was involved. Then. There was Doug De Silva, a local auto mechanic who had previously been arrested and locked up in the rape of a woman not far from where Julie was murdered. We subsequently interviewed him number, a number of times. He was eventually released, DNA cleared him, but police believe he's still somehow connected to Julie's case. He didn't have a solid alibi of where he was at at that time. He provided some statements that would indicate that he could possibly be involved, but nothing that would actually push it over the edge where we can charge him. Crime Watch Daily wanted to talk to De Silva, only to learn he was nowhere to be found. April? Hi, are you April, Doug De Silva's daughter? Yes. But we did locate his daughter, April, who told us she and her family have not seen nor heard from him for 16 years. I don't know where he is. I wish I could help, but I don't know. But April has been vainly searching for her father, whom she says appeared to vanish off the face of the earth several years after the murder of Julie Ferguson. I've contacted all kind of Congress people. I've contacted Social Security. I have contacted, I have a whole file of places that I've contacted about this. April finds it hard to believe her father would have murdered Julie. I've never seen him hurt anyone. I mean, I've never seen him hurt an animal or he's very caring, he's very generous. Now she is pleading with him to come forward and clear his name. It's important to, you know, my dad's legacy. And Julie's still grieving mother is pleading for anyone who knows anything about her daughter's murder to contact police and help them finally solve this case. Somebody out there knows something and I just Wish they'd come forward and tell their story. Julie's old high school friends have a Facebook page they hope might attract some leads, as well as keep Julie's memory and case alive. It's important because she might be forgotten. What happened to her might be forgotten, and she's not. A reward of up to $25,000 is available for information leading to an indictment or arrest in the case. Anyone with information can call this number anonymously, 1-866-411-TIPS. Coming up, a beautiful co-ed disappears from campus after dance practice. When police find her body, they quickly make an arrest, then hit a major roadblock. Next. 
it was a crime that stunned a major college campus. Police say an aspiring young dancer at the University of Texas was stalked, attacked, and murdered after leaving class. The first homicide on the campus in more than 50 years. We've got the latest on the tragic death, the arrest, and the new twist now delaying the case. Here's Reed Grinsell. Haruka Weiser was a beautiful college student, a dance major who touched everyone she knew. The consummate BFA dance student and just a natural leader to her, her classmates. The 18-year-old was a star dancer at the University of Texas in Austin. On a Sunday night, Haruka left this dance studio and simply vanished. On Monday morning when the students first alerted me to her being missing, it became probably one of the worst weeks of my life. When Haruka didn't show up for classes, cops launched a frantic search. It didn't last long. The next day, detectives found her body in a creek that runs through campus. She was strangled to death and sexually assaulted. Haruka's killing is the first murder on the UT campus in 50 years. Back in 1966, a deranged sniper climbed the university tower and shot 46 innocent people, killing 14. This time, Austin cops were stumped. Who killed this beautiful girl? Then, a big break. This grainy surveillance video. Look closely. It shows a young man with a backpack on a pink bicycle, a girl's bicycle. From this angle, he appears to be fumbling with another bag. Austin police were tight-lipped about the guy on tape. I mean, the ultimate goal here is that uh, we want to see justice. And to do that, uh, there's just certain details that we really can't re uh, uh, release at this time. So who is that mystery man? Austin police eventually reveal it's this man, Mikhail Kreiner, a 17-year-old runaway. Cops found him in this abandoned building. Kreiner was arrested and charged with capital murder. His attorney, Ariel Pion, tells our Austin affiliate, KXAN, Kreiner has some mental issues. He was confused, uh, was very polite, um, didn't really understand what was going on, um, but was able to answer questions. Remember the bag in the surveillance video the man was fumbling with? According to the arrest warrant obtained by Crime Watch Daily, Kreiner had possession of a bag which cops say belonged to the victim and was the one she had with her when she left the dance building. But as Kreiner sits behind bars on a $1 million bond, a strange twist, justice will be delayed. Austin Police Department shuts down the DNA testing lab. You heard right, there's no police laboratory. The Austin Crime Lab is closed, possibly for the next two years. State investigators claim they found problems in DNA testing. I feel worried that I use DNA reports that now I don't have 100% confidence in. The murder trial is now stalled because of the lab shutdown. Austin cops sent his DNA samples to a laboratory run by the state's Department of Public Safety. They have not um, been able to finish the, the testing, is, is all they keep saying. Kreiner is expected to plead not guilty. It's been a rough time for Haruka's family and friends. They say her spirit will continue to burn bright. We're all gonna miss, we're gonna miss.